part two. If you've tucked your Bible away, you've turned your iPad off, pull that back out, turn it back on, open back up to 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to wrap up this letter. And you thought you got off easy this morning with a shorter message, huh? Not so fast. 1 Peter chapter 5. See, really, your teaching team, uh, one of the things I appreciate, your teaching team, we're kind of determined that on our own, we're not much, but between the three of us, maybe we make one good preacher, you know? So maybe between the two of us this morning, we could come up with one good message to wrap up this incredible letter of 1 Peter. And Daniel said it earlier, I, I hope that 1 Peter has transformed you as a Jesus follower like it has me, like it has our family. I, I pray that it's an exercise for you and your family to gather maybe around the dinner table, whatever that looks like, and say, hey, what have we learned through 1 Peter? What has God shown us? What has God transformed in us through this letter over the last six months? I hope you do that as individuals and as a family over the next few weeks. So how does Peter conclude this letter? We've looked at it already. How does Peter conclude a letter written to brothers and sisters in the Roman world, again, who are striving to live faithfully in a world that's not their home? How does he conclude this letter? How does he conclude this letter to us in 2022 who maybe are realizing for the first time that to follow Jesus faithfully in our culture is going to cost us. How does he conclude this letter? How does he conclude this letter to faithful Jesus followers who maybe you see so many others chasing empty pursuits, settled for for watered-down Christianity, or maybe we see so many walking away from the church altogether. How does Peter end this letter as encouragement and a challenge for us? So we've read it already. I just want to read verse 12 again. Remind us of the big truth. Daniel's given us one big idea. I'm going to give you a second big idea. We're going to talk about that briefly. Verse 12 again. Let's look there together. Peter writes and he says, by Silvanius, that's Silas, evidently this was the fellow that delivers this letter, he says, a faithful brother as I regard him, he says, I have written briefly to you, I've exhorted you through this letter, strongly encouraged, I've declared to you through this letter. That word declare literally is the word testify. It's as if Peter is saying, I'm confirming by firsthand personal evidence. Remember, this is the man that walked with Jesus for three and a half years. He's testifying by personal firsthand account. And he says that this, this letter that I've written you, these preceding five chapters, what I've written here about is ultimately the true grace of God. And then this incredible admonition. If you circle it in your Bible, circle it, star it, whatever it is. He says this, stand firm in it, brothers and sisters. I love that. Stand firm in it. So the big truth again is to stand firm in the true grace of God. We've talked about it already, but when he says grace here, don't get some nebulous idea of this idea of grace. Grace has been used throughout this letter as a term representing all that God has graciously and freely done. All that God has graciously and freely given. Wrapped up in the perfect, inimaginable character of who God is is flowing out of him all that he has done, watch this, all he is doing and all he will do on behalf of his elect exiles. Grace. And Peter says, I've written to you about this incredible grace of God. Stand firm in it. The idea of to stand firm is to take your stand anchor down in it. it it is a command of action it's not passive 
It's very similar to what the Apostle Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 1 there. He says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, that is found in Christ Jesus for every born-again believer. This idea of standing firm, and again, Daniel mentioned this, but think about this, this idea of standing firm, hold your ground, anchor deeply. It's implying a reality that, that there are things, there are forces working against us to move us away from where we are anchored as followers of Jesus. Peter even mentions some of those in this letter. It quickly, he mentions the flesh, the residue of sin that's in every believer. He says, I urge you as aliens and strangers. We looked at this back in 1 Peter 2. I urge you as aliens and strangers, abstain from fleshly lusts. They're waging war against your soul. Stand firm in the grace of God. It's this worldly system working against us. Paul mentions it in Ephesians 4 when he says, don't be tossed here and there to and fro by every wind of doctrine, everything that comes down the pike. Don't you be tossed to and fro by every false thing that comes down the pike or that you see on Twitter or Facebook. Stand firm in the grace of God. And by the way, in just a few weeks, we're going to be in 2 Peter when, second, when he comes back and writes the second letter challenging and exposing false teachers and false doctrine that are tempted to cause us to not stand firm or to stray away. He's going to expose that in 2 Peter. He even mentions the devil himself trying to uproot us from standing firm. We saw this even a few weeks ago. Be of sober spirit. Be on your alert. You have an adversary. He's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Stand firm. So Daniel mentioned one aspect of this grace of God that we are to stand firm in. It is a future reality of our living hope that is unshakable in the person of Christ because of what Christ has done, because of what Christ will do. We can stand firm in the grace of God that is found in Christ, this living hope. The second one I want us to look at that's been a theme throughout this book, this letter of 1 Peter, I Hope you've seen this theme is this one. This is our second big idea. Stand firm in the grace of belonging. Stand firm in the grace of belonging. Belonging to what? We belong by the grace of God to the people of God. There is a theme that has been pulled throughout these chapters. Peter mentions it over and over and over to these elect exiles. The recurring theme is this immense value, the true grace of God that is the gift of belonging by grace to God's redeemed family. You belong by grace to the family of God. And Peter says that is a grace. That is a grace we are to anchor in. We are to stand firm in it. He reminds these exiles, and it's a reminder to us, you have not only been redeemed by Christ, but you've been redeemed by Christ into a family, the people of God. It, he says this throughout the letter. Just, you don't have to look at these. Just listen how he says it. 1 Peter 1.22, he says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, you've been born again, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. You've been born again into the family of God. You belong to the family of God by His grace. Stand firm in it. 1 Peter 2.5 says, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to, to be a holy priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. You are being built up as a holy house acceptable to God. You belong to the people of God by the grace of God. Stand firm in that and all the implications of that in our lives. 1 Peter 4.8, he says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of transgressions. 
Even here at the end, these last few verses that we look at, that let's be honest, we tend to read in our Bibles and we think these are just meaningless greetings to people we're not even sure who he's talking to. We, we miss this a huge truth. Even in verse 14, as the book comes to a close, Peter says, greet one another, greet one another with the kiss of love. <laughs> Then you read that and you go, to, what's, what's Paul and Dan, what's Mike and Daniel going to do with that? The kiss of love. Well, we don't practice that a whole lot in our culture, but this is a sign of affection of God's people to one another. If you chose to come up after the service and plant a big kiss on Pastor Daniel's cheek, you would be very biblical in doing it. All right. Don't necessarily recommend it. Brotherly affection. Brotherly love. Now watch. He ends this letter and he says, peace, wholeness, completeness to all of you, the the people of God who are, here's the last two words in this letter, I want you to notice this, in Christ. You are in Christ. And by grace, your union with Christ means that there is a union with one another and this incredible thing called the church. There is the grace of belonging to something that is bigger than ourselves. We have been redeemed unto Christ to belong to a family, the people of God. We are in union with Him and we are in union with one another. Now quickly, I want to show you an example very fast in in 1 Peter that he mentions. We looked at this weeks ago. I'm not going to take a long time to look at this. You can look in your Bibles if you'd like, but look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. Here's an example of the grace given to us by God of belonging. Stand firm in it. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. He says, but you... And in the original language, that is you all, right? He said, all of you, people of God, not every person, but those who belong to Christ, all of you, you are a chosen race. This is an immense grace of belonging. That even though we may be scorned and devalued by the world, Peter reminds you were chosen, sovereignly elected by God. And that is communicating immense value. You are a chosen race. He says you are a royal priesthood. Meaning we by grace collectively belong to this royal king, King Jesus and his priesthood. We belong to serve this king. We belong to serve on behalf of this king. And also connected to this is future tense. One day in eternity we will reign with this king. Immense. This is the grace of God. Stand firm in it. He says you're a holy nation. Like Israel, the church now has the unique place in all of creation of being set apart, holy, distinct from. We mentioned earlier the different way we live because we have been declared holy. You're not like the world. You've been set apart. You are a holy people. Why? How? The grace of God in Christ Jesus. He purchased your positional holiness. He bought it by his blood. Therefore, we are able to pursue practical holiness in our day-to-day life because he's purchased our positional holiness and declared his people to be holy. Not individuals, collectively the holy people of God. Incredible. You are a people for his own possession, it says in verse 9. We as a people belong to one another because we belong to him. But watch this. This means we don't, we're not our own. We've been bought with a price. We're not merely individuals doing our own thing. We belong to him and we belong to one another as members of God's people. He says that you may proclaim the excellencies. Of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Just lavish language of God's grace given freely to us in Christ Jesus. 
remind yourselves over and over and over through the revealed truth of Scripture of this grace of God and stand firm in it. Stand firm in the realities of what is ours in Christ Jesus purchased by His grace. Listen, it should jump off the page to you that the language here of belonging is much more than mere togetherness. Oh, that means we need to be together. Yes, we need to be together. But there's much more than that. It's much more than just shallow community that the world offers. It's much more than a warm welcome of God's people. It is a rock-solid, unwavering, biblical reality that we have been purchased by the grace of God. His cross and resurrection has bought us. We are in union with Christ. We are now in union with Him. We have value. We have a purpose. We have a king. And you belong to the people of God. Stand firm in the grace of that. Stand firm. Stand firm that is the grace of of this hope that is in Christ and stand firm in this grace that is this grace of belonging. See, the message of the world wants to give you plenty of things to chase about your identity and who you are, but the Bible declares and promises that in Christ our identity is not rooted in what the world says we are, but rooted in the very character of who God is and who He has declared His people to be. Stand firm in that. See, the world wants us to hear that our value is found in lesser things, but this declares that our value is not rooted in how the world may see us or treat us, but in the price God paid in His Son to redeem us as revealed in this Word. You were ransomed. You were bought with a price. Stand firm in the grace of God. Our purpose is not found in temporal truths that fade away or temporal pursuits that fade away. Our purpose is found, according to 2 Peter, in that we know and we proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Stand firm in that. And we are to stand firm that our future, not just the now, our future is set in Christ is not determined by the uncertainties of this world or of his worldly leaders, but by the living hope promised and revealed in the living word of God. Stand firm in that living hope. So as we bring this letter to a close and we hear the encouragement and the admonition that Peter gives to those disciples then, it is the same to us, brothers and sisters. This makes known to us the true grace of God. And as we pour our lives and our hearts to know the true grace of God together, not on our own, as the people of God purchased by God for a price of His Son, we stand firm in the true grace of God. So I'm going to ask the team to come back up and we're going to sing again a, a song of response. And as they come and as we prepare to stand and sing, I'm going to read just these last few words from Peter, this letter, to us, over us, and close this time and we'll continue to sing. Peter says this, This, all that I've written you, this is the true grace of God. Know it. Study it. Read it. Memorize it. Feast on it. And stand firm in it. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Peace to all of you. And here's the way the letter ends. Don't miss this. Peace to all of you. In Christ. In Christ. We're in union with Him. We've been purchased by His blood. And by nature of our union with Him, we are in a dynamic union with one another. We belong to something bigger than ourselves. Stand firm in it. Father, thank You for this word. Lord, I pray we never take for granted the gift of Your word that You have preserved, You have inspired, You have delivered to us. 
God, I pray us, just like those elect exiles 2,000 years ago that Peter wrote to, Lord. Let us read, meditate, feast on, pray through, study, teach, proclaim, declare the grace of God that is written in this book. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here that in a world that everything is trying to uproot us from truth, Lord, I pray by your grace and by your spirit we will stand firm in the true grace of God. Help us. And Lord, even as we prepare to sing this song now, Lord, help us to know what is truth and what we believe and what your word says and stand firm in that truth. For Jesus' sake we pray. All God's people said together, amen. Why don't you stand?